Stories of Bad Company. Howard, Hello. thanks for talking to us today. My pleasure. Howard is not only with Bad Company, he's got a CD coming out and it's right here and it's not even out till tomorrow, so lucky I have it. Uh, Secret Weapon, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, like I just said, tomorrow uh, Secret Weapon will be unleashed. It's your first solo release. Why all of a sudden to do a solo record right now? Well, I've always been working with bands. You know, I was at Heart for 20-something years, and I've been playing with Paul for a long time. But a few summers ago, Paul had uh, a tour with Queen, and so I had the summer off. And I just put some gear up in my house, and I thought, I'm going to start recording some friends of mine. I said, why don't you make a, your own record? I had never even kind of occurred to me to do that, because I always work in the framework of a band. But I started writing, and, and, it's, and it was really fun, and it ended up... Uh, turning into a project at some point I said I'm gonna make a whole album you know at first I thought I'd just do some instrumental tracks maybe use them for a film or whatever but um, when I started getting other people involved uh, I started making an album and it just sort of snowballed from there well you got a wide array of artists on this uh, CD everybody from Joel and Turner Keith Emerson Deanna Johnson in the name of you how did you get these collection of artists uh, together to work on your effort yeah it's kind of funny how things how things happen um, Jimmy Jameson sings the vine on there, and he just heard the song. A friend of mine had the the demo of it, the track of it, with the girl who I wrote it with, Jamie Kyle. And he just loved the song. I was thinking Steve Perry for the song, but um, Jimmy said, oh, I, you got to let me sing it. And so um, I said, well, if you sing it great, then it'll be your song. And he did. You know, He sort of claimed it, that song. In other cases, like Jolyn and I are friends, I just sent Joe a track, and he wrote an incredible vocal. Paul Rogers obviously is is the guy I work with, and um, he loves my mandolin playing. And we do mandolin uh, versions of different things. Him and I do a version of Silver, Blue, and Gold that's just piano and mandolin. And uh, I've played mandolin on Feel Like Making Love in the solo. And we 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 use the mandolin here and there, and he loves the sound of it. So I thought, well, I'm going to write a mandolin track, and um, Paul liked it, and so he wrote the vocal for that. The blues track by Andrew Black is just something that. Um, the Paul Rogers band, we were up in, in my place in Seattle and we um, recorded in the, in the living room that blues track. And uh, somebody had sent me a tape of Andrew Black. He's a singer, an unknown singer from uh, Atlanta. And I wanted to have some, some of my famous friends, but I also wanted to have some uh, uh, showcase some new, new guys that aren't generally well known. So Andrew is one of them. Keith St. John is the other one, a singer in LA. But uh, Andrew was, he's like a real blues cat in Georgia, you know, and he he's the authentic thing, and so so we sent him the blues track, and he did a real nice job on that. Is it the the songs just sort of found appropriate guys, you know? Yeah, that was actually one of my other questions. When writing for the CD, did you aim for like a certain style, or like you were just saying, it kind of everything just kind of blended together? It's a funny thing. You may try to aim for a certain style, but. It's this, you don't really have that much control over what comes out. I just sit and play and wait for me to play something that's interesting, you know. And so you may try to write in one direction or another direction, but it seems to me it's kind of hard to control what what comes out. I just let the ideas come out, and then you follow the idea more or less, you know. I something will suggest something else to me, or you know, I look f I look for things that have a mood to them. I try to write something that has convey some kind of emotion whether it's heaviness or or more gentle fragile feeling or just different moods and m music to me is a way to make other make the listener feel something that's what i try to do i try to make it emotional what's the one that is hidden the one that's hidden is something that i did in 1968 as a young uh, st one of my first sessions as a session guy when i was like 17. That's the track I was thinking about. Yeah, it's this crazy fuzz guitar solo thing. That's the one. Yeah, that's not listed, and, yes. and it's just a just something I wanted to throw on there just for the heck of it. It's, it's, it's me in the psychedelic 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. The guy says he was a filmmaker from Holland. He goes, I've, I want this piece to be, plays that crazy psychedelic guitar. I go, okay, I can do that. So that's just some... That's a, a broken fuzz tone, and uh, <laughs> that was the 60s. That seemed like a cool idea at the time. Okay, what's the name of the track, then? Um, doesn't really have a name. Burbank 1968, maybe. <laughs> That's where I was at the time. That's, That's the track I met. Not somewhere, so sorry for the confusion, but... Um, 
Another question, like we're talking about, uh, yeah, obviously that you produce the CD, is it more of a like putting pressure on yourself? Is it more pressure producing something of your soul effort, so to speak, or was it more like say pressure of producing like a band like Heart, where you were producing a lot of the Heart albums? It's completely different because when you're working in a band, everybody bounces ideas off of one another, and. Um, Sometimes you agree, sometimes you agree to disagree. You know, there's there's give and take, push and pull, and everybody gets their ideas, and it, it takes on a tapestry of its own. When you're working alone, it's strange because there's no one to react to anything. So I'm just doing it by myself. I, I kind of thought of myself as like a painter when you go in the studio and you just start painting each day, and you go in when you when, when the inspiration strikes you. So that's how I worked this time. I, I worked at home, and... Uh, but I worked alone, so it was it, it was cool in a way because I didn't have anybody to go. Well, what, did you like that solo, or you like this solo, or which one is better? I was just I was the only arbiter of taste, and so that makes it kind of cool. It makes it kind of personal. I would do it till I liked it, right. and if I like it, then I I hope that 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 standard is is something that the people will like. But I I hold myself to high standards. I did it to my <laughs> my singers too, but my own personal recording ethic is no punching in, no taking half of this solo and half of this solo. Putting all of my solos are one pass, an actual performance. So I like to document, to actually record, make a record of a performance. A lot of people these days are assembling music from pieces of other people's yeah. music, and uh, I just don't think that's honest uh, artistry. So so I play all my tracks all the way through if I can't make it all the way through that's that's how I challenge myself to to get better I'll I'll keep doing it until I do get it perfect and then that, that's the one that I I keep and then I held all the singers to the uh, the Ann Wilson standard which is you come in and you sing it three times and you leave because she was so good that she was singing three times and we would just pick one she still is, and she still is and so I made Joe do the same thing I told the singers um, I want three three passes First one, just sing it normally, like we wrote it. Second time, give it a little more, a little more gas. And on the third time, go nuts, because you already have the f the ones we're probably going to use in the can. So on the third one, let loose. And that, of course, is the one that I always used. The third one where they go nuts, because people that can sing at that caliber, you just want to let them just get out of their way, basically, you know. Speaking of heart, it's been 12 years since you left the band, but you were with them for so long. You were with them for almost 22 years. Um, I don't know. I'm a huge heart fan, but why did you decide to leave the band back then? Well, we just really weren't working very much, and Nancy was taking a break to have a family, and Ann Wilson and I went out for a couple of summers as the Ann Wilson Band, which was sort of like a funkier um, rhythm and blues-inflected thing. But it, it really didn't seem like heart was going to actually go out, go out again full force you know so I tell people the story I came home I did my last gig with Ann Wilson on a Saturday night I flew home on Sunday I was retired all day Monday and I thought finally I'm not, you know I'm gonna just stay home and write and record and not, not travel and then Tuesday I got the phone call from Paul Rogers Pine Knob Friday night here's the set list and so just uh, I had a day there when I wasn't in the band. <laughs> we retire for one day, kind of like the Brett Favre thing, retiring for a day and coming back. Right? Exactly, and that's, <laughs> that's 11 years ago. I've been with Paul 11 years, and now uh, you know, we usually play every summer as the Paul Rogers solo band, but th this year we're, it's bad company, so it's extra juicy this year because I'm playing with Mick and Simon, you know, and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible to see these guys get back, you know, bring, this, bring that music back to life, you know.